don't try to be funny or interesting. That's like the death of it. And you see it with stand-ups. It sounds counterintuitive. Like, we want to be funny and interesting. But you watch a new person on stage, like a brand new comic, you're like, they're trying so hard to be funny and trying so hard to be interesting that it's off-putting. It's actually off-putting. Whereas the person who walks up and is not trying to be funny or interesting is uh, much more compelling to watch. And if somebody's compelling to watch, then you're more likely to laugh at what they say. Uh, I'm cut in here. Welcome to the show, Ryan Bell. What's this happening? is the Johnny Welcome. Rogers show. Thanks so much for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Because I always look at guys like yourself. You know, I had Mike Wilmot on and, and Darren Frost. You guys are like the, the heavy hitters that we looked up to in the Toronto comedy scene. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're both way older than me. <laughs> no, so I know. Just put it out there. You know what I mean? Like same <laughs> no, category care. of skill level of just like not even uh, beyond age. Well, it's uh, a funny thing when you go from being uh, you're like, I, I was the ingenue, the young the young cutie who showed up on the scene and was tearing it up. I'm like, I'm the young buck. And then you're like, oh, no, no, I'm the old guard. I'm seeing now. that now and I'm only 32. Yeah. I'm like, oh, damn, this new person's coming up and they're like. <laughs> it happens. It's funny because you go because I've been in and out of Canada so much over the last 20 years and I'll, I'll live in Toronto and then I'll be gone and I'll be back or working. And uh, the first time I came back was, I don't know, I'm going to say like mid late 2000s. And I uh, went to the old stomping ground, which used to be the Rivoli in Toronto. Uh, what were the other hip venues at the time? It was probably like the Rivoli and a couple other places. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, the, the new crew is in town. It was all like uh, Dave Merhej and people like that. It's like brand new crew. Like you're no longer cock of the walk. You're no longer the king. And then it's like a new crew of people. And you're like, oh, I used to be cool. <laughs> and then you, you 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 have to reprove yourself and come back yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then those guys, you know, you hang out with Dave, and now Dave and I will be chatting. We're like, we're the old, we're the old fuckers, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's like because uh, I moved from Toronto to Ottawa in the pandemic, Pardon and me. so just like that's okay, just uh, going like around in the local Ottawa comedy scene. I'm talking to comics that have been doing it like a year, like six months, and like, but they have like a little crew that goes right. that goes around together, right? And so they're looking at me like who's this guy? Is he new to stand up or whatever? And then it's not until somebody like Wafik or one of the older comics that have been in the area for a while are like, Oh, Hey Johnny, what's going on? And I'm like, Oh, oh okay. Okay. He's been... Cause I look like a baby, but like I've been doing comedy for 12 years. Like I started right. as soon as I was like 19 and could get into the bars. What, right. what, um, I don't want to say provoked, but what, uh, made you want to get into stand up comedy? Cause you also got into like comedy and acting like very young as well. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, my parents are both actors and artists. They, they did other things too. My father did like advertising for a long time, but they were both originally artists and then both went back to it later in life. My mother was a big leading lady at the Shaw Festival in Canada for a long time. Big, uh, Canadian kind of, um, well-known stage actress. Uh, and when I was a kid, I did some stage shows. They're like, ever like, Hey, you want to act? You're just surrounded by all the time. So I did some stage shows and some commercials and some movies um i didn't love it as a kid i wasn't and it was not like i was some big yeah, young star or anything but i was just exposed to it and then i got a little turned off at times uh which i can delve into later but i was like Ugh. and then when i was a teenager i was a bit of out of control like i was out of control frankly late into my life but like i was uh, out of control as a teenager and then i found this place called the loose moose theater in calgary which is like an improv and comedy theater that offers like training and like uh uh, Bruce McDonald, uh, Bruce McCullough, and uh, um, uh, Mark McKinney, kind of kids in the hall, kind of began there. Like that was the baby area. Norm Hiscock, a lot of big comedy writers, a lot of big like uh, people uh, in Canada and the U.S. actually came from there originally, and then that kind of spiraled. But I loved comedy growing up. I was surrounded by it. I loved American comedy. Like we used to come, we used to, we spent a lot of time in America. My mom's America. I'd watch like old Saturday Night Live. I'd watch uh, Laugh In. Lots of stand up. I was addicted to the comic relief tapes I'd get from Blockbuster. I'd watch them over and over again. So I just kind of loved it. And then it, it because I started performing at a young age, it kind of took off. And all of a sudden mm -hmm. I was like 18 and I'm traveling the world and performing. And um, and then like when I was 21, I moved to Toronto and it was kind of off to the race. 2021, 20, I moved to Toronto. It was kind of the next level. So it's sort of like it just sort of happened. I just. OK, but yeah. like. um. Yeah. Did you find that you had like a you didn't really you could 
have the confidence kind of right away because you had been so used to maybe like going into audition rooms and whatnot like because often people are scared of going on stage and talking because they're scared of rejection right like that's kind of what it boils back down to um yeah i mean a little bit of theater i was like i was aware of the creative process at a very young age and then the loose moose theater is a is a is a great comedy theater like you got to perform to these full houses every week but it was a teaching place sometimes almost back in the day it was a lot harsher very critical very open like this is what you're doing wrong this is what you're doing wrong okay and it was about teaching you how to learn how to fail and stop trying to like they have a lot of they had a lot of um were sayings that uh keith johnstone the famous teacher who created the theater but had a lot of famous sayings like uh don't be prepared uh if you walk you know if you walk in with a preconceived idea you're already dead um don't try to be funny or interesting that's like the death of it and you see it with stand-ups it sounds counterintuitive like we want to be funny and interesting <clears throat> but you watch a new person on stage like a brand new comic you're like they're trying so hard to be funny and trying yeah. so hard to be interesting that it's off-putting yeah it's actually yeah. off-putting whereas the person who walks up and is not trying to be funny or interesting is uh much more compelling to watch and if somebody's compelling to watch then you're more likely to laugh at what they say it sounds very like heady no no i know what you mean like i definitely laugh harder when i can tell that like someone is just being honest and uh yes even genuine with like a character like if say if they like go a hundred percent into like a character and i can tell that they're like being genuine with that character and not mm -hmm. not doing it because they think it's going to be funny but just doing because they're like this is what i want to do always right. makes me laugh so much so much harder well it's like also how we uh a lot of comics you ask them like who are the funniest people and you're like it's i mean a lot of times it's comics a lot of times it's not it's like their buddy at the poker game yeah it's like, yeah that, oh that that guy would never be good on stage but when you catch him when he's just being a normal guy that's the funniest person i know and oh alexa shut up <laughs> would it be funny it. if my daughter walked in and her name was alexa <laughs> and you're like wow that, <laughs> belleville's a dick uh, that oh, would be we should do hilarious. like that would be such a funny like podcast preview Alexa, clip to release for the up. episode just have yeah. your daughter walk behind you yeah <laughs> or just on the wall it just alexa. says like her name alexa, alexa. with like a photo of her so <laughs> it's just, just implied <laughs> alexa i told you to find me some music um what no 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 don't find me music <laughs> She's, alexa she... stop Alexa, stop responding to Alexa. Oh my God, I hate these smart things. See, Grampy can't handle the. Um... Anyways, what was going to say? <laughs> oh, um, uh, yeah, I was a street performer for a few years too before I became a stand-up. So it's like I had the artsy fartsy background. What did you do as a street performer? Comedy, improv, stunts. Uh, stunts. We would, stunts. We'd light ourselves on fire. We. <laughs> I had a partner. We'd jump each other on little bikes we would eventually we did which was kind of like a rip off of a rip off but we do like a, a two person saran wrap escape was jackass uh, out jackass already? was not no this is oh, like wow. we're it's talking like, like 1996 <laughs> i'm ryan belleville and i'm gonna light myself on fire, fire. Down, yeah. Down, down. <laughs> yeah we made like minimal money like we, i'd be you'd be in australia dude. trying to make enough money to make a uh Hungry Jacks, which is called Burger King down there. So did you just do it for the thrill then? I did it to survive. I was like in Australia ah. hanging out and I saw friends I knew from Loose Moose who were doing an indoor show and like, do you want to do street shows? I mean, yeah. And I needed it because I had no, I had no money. I was like, mm. I did not plan my trip. And um, I traveled all around Australia doing that. Went back and did, we went a, uh, uh, we actually won like street uh, at the Adelaide Fringe, which is like the next level after Edinburgh. We won best street act. Uh, and it was just chaos. Like we just did chaotic stuff. And then the, the, by the time we came back the next time, we'd actually built an act that can make some money. Uh, but by that point, I'm like, I don't know. I knew it was, I can't do this. I can't, you're, you're almost like a living on the street, sort of like yeah, not yeah. homeless, but, but you're, you're outside all the time. You're outside yeah, all yeah. the time. There's, you're getting in fights. You got to worry about people like stealing your shit. And yeah. And you look at some of the older guys and you're like, they're all methed out. They got kids in weird countries. And you're like, this is crazy, man. So <laughs> they got kids in weird countries is a fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like just crazy people. You're like, yeah, where are your yeah. kids? One's in, one's in Lancaster and one's in, one's yeah. in like Tibet. And you're like, what? <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, while you're in Australia, is that when you met like uh, Reese Darby? I uh, know doing... I met Reese uh, through. Where did I meet Reese first? Oh, you know what? My brother met him first uh, in LA, and then we just kind of all hung out and hit it off, and and then we started talking, 
And it was one of those things where it's like, oh, you know, so-and-so is like, oh, Ryan, you know, so-and-so, you know that guy? Oh, he's a great we, impression. We have a, we a, <laughs> a lot of mutual friends, Ryan and I. And um, just through the friend circuit and uh, yeah. yeah, we just kind of hit it off that way. But it's just that sort of, um, it's a different culture, the fringe kind of alt mm -hmm. European and like Australian, all those comics. Uh, it's almost like if you, you can kind of pick up with them after not seeing them for 10, 15 years or, and, and you're, you're just back to square one or, or you just kind of nod like, Oh, I'm one of you. I'm, Oh, and mm -hmm. you just kind of take off. Whereas I find sometimes in, especially in America, if you're walking to a club, you don't get a lot of uh, leeway until they see your act. True. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very much so. And then you smash it in the club. You smash it on a show. I'm like, oh, okay, he's legit. But yeah, you're welcomed into the inner circle. I think in Canada, we're kind of just like, if you say you're a comedian, you're like, welcome in. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Kind of... <laughs> Canada's like the the halfway point where the people are still skeptical, yeah, yeah, but they're yeah. it's a bit more like, yeah, sure, everyone in the tent. Yeah, or they won't say that you're funny. Like if they haven't seen you a lot, they'll go, "He's nice." Nice guy. nice guy. Nice guy. Nobody wants to be the nice <laughs> Nobody guy. Nobody wants to be the nice guy. <laughs> what a nice guy. What a nice Somebody guy. Somebody asked me about a comic that like uh and uh, he knew her and I had only seen him like once and I was like they're like is he good? And I was like I haven't I'm not going to lie to you. I haven't seen him enough times to be able to give you a straight answer. I think he's just nice. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, right. I meant that genuinely, but like, yeah. and there's maybe potential, but like, who knows, right? Like, yeah, and it's it's also um, it's a uh, it's hard to tell because it's everyone works at a different pace, like a different pace. Like when I moved yeah. to Toronto, like I said, I was the young buck, but I'd already been aggressively performing for about five or six years, mm -hmm. and three years, like I, that was my like I had to make money, so I. I I kind of knew the game. Uh, so it was a bit different than being a regular open micer. Like I knew True. how to entertain a crowd for an hour. And if I, they weren't entertained, I wouldn't make money. So uh, it, it's so it's a bit different. So people are like, oh, that guy's a fast riser. But then I had other friends who were super slow, who were on like the open mic scene forever and became like amazing comedians or people you were like, I wouldn't have expected that person to be. Yeah. Yeah. Some sort of like it just it always surprises you. That's my thing with open mics too, is like, I feel like I've, I've done the the grind of open mics in the Toronto scene. And uh, when I started, I would go to like, you know, Kingston and try to do absolute and go to Montreal and Ottawa because I was from Brockville. So it was kind of just wherever it was hop, skip and a jump away. But mm -hmm. when I got to Toronto, I, I like grinded out open mics. So when, coming back to Ottawa, I was like, well, I'm only really going to go if I like need to work on new material that I don't want to do for a paying crowd. Because right. if somebody's paying to see a show, it's like, I'm not going to be like, here's some new, <laughs> here's some new shit. That's where we differ, my man. Really? That's where we differ. Oh, yeah. Depends okay. on the show. It depends how much I'm getting paid. Explain. Explain. Uh, I have I have no qualms at walking into a comedy club where I'm not necessarily like super billed or even if I'm billed where I'm not like actively advertised. And I know for a fact that the tickets were like 10 or 15 bucks okay. and there's like a whole bunch of paper in the room. I'm like, fuck that, man. Yeah, yeah, even, yeah. If, even if they all paid 15 bucks, they paid 15 bucks. I guarantee you my fucking around is probably going to be worth at least 15 bucks. That's now, a good way to look at it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's that's also like. Yeah, yeah, that's just kind of how I feel. But then again, you walk into other venues like if you're charging $50 a ticket and your name's on a marquee, then you're like, yeah, I'm going to, um, yeah. yeah, maybe I'll, I'll be off the cuff and have some funny moments, but I'm not going to be out here going like, Hey, let's try that controversial chunk. Yeah. Yeah. You got a book on your yeah. uh, stool that you're flipping through. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's, let's do both controversial and not yet funny bits. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Oh, this one's got some promise. How about this? <laughs> Just yeah. go right into it. Mm -hmm. I heard uh, Norm Macdonald used to do that. He'd pop into like, uh, he'd pop into clubs and ask to go up like if, if they were cool with it, like after the headline or whatever, he's like, yeah, Norm just came in. Do you mind if he does some time like after you? Every person was like, yeah, of sure. Course. Of course. That'd be amazing. Right. And one night he went up there and he just was like doing a bit about apples. And then he just started naming all the apples. He'd be like, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the gala, uh, gala apple. Uh, you got green apples, uh, Macintosh. And he just did that until the entire room just got up and left because they were just tired. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, you just the, kept the naming apples. <laughs> like you're like that is the level that I want to reach, where you can just come in and just lift up, list off some apples and yeah, and not, also like, not if, really care. <laughs> and if also like a crowd, especially if it's Norm Macdonald, like if a crowd sees that. And goes, I'm never going back to this comedy club because yeah. that's what happened. I'm like, screw it. They shouldn't be at a comedy show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you just saw a full great show. And then someone brought out some cherries. And you're like, well, I don't like cherries on my dessert. I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't make the whole dessert shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, I want to go back to what you were saying about how you kind of got turned off about the, was it the acting industry or like theater? What? Um, uh... Well, I got... A couple things. One, I mean, from a greater sense, I was turned off of um, theater and acting, quote, acting. Like, I was supposed to go audition for the National Theater School, which I blew off. I got accepted to another program, which I blew off. Uh, I just hated how actors and artists had to wait for everybody. I just hated that. I mean, Mm -hmm. I grew up watching my parents who were very successful, well, successful, but like worked a lot and respected. Um, I'm like, they would sit and have to wait for somebody to give them a job. And I hate that. As especially as yeah. an artist, you're like, the whole reason I do art is to be seen and be heard and be able to express myself. And I have to wait for some other dipshit to give me a job to let me express yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah. And then even if they do give me a job expressing myself, what am I going to be spear carrier number nine in some Shakespearean play I don't give a shit about? So um, I don't like that. That I didn't care about. When I was a kid, I did. It's funny, like I, I did a couple of parts. I remember doing. And my parents never pressured me to do it. They were like, never, you never have to do it. It was nice to make a little bit of money and make, quote, some college money, traveling money. But uh, there's a movie called Something in Sam. I can't remember what it was. It shot in Calgary in like 1992. And I got asked by like the casting director if I'd come in and be the stand-in because I looked like the lead kid. Okay. And I'm like, I don't know what a stand-in is. And I go stand-in, you look like, you know, you stand in when the actors aren't on, on screen you you stand in their spot so they can light and do stuff. I'm like, okay, sure. I I I've been on set, seemed fine. And I got there, and the whole time you you have to work. They want you like get in the get in the spot, like because the actors are only working for five friggin' minutes. Yeah. And the yeah. rest of the time you're working, and they want me I'm like my only other experience on set was like you get to sit around eat, eat a chocolate bar, maybe read a comic book, and then you you do something. And uh, the ads were like they were everyone was so nice to this kid who was the star. <laughs> It was a nobody, uh, but so nice. This kid is a star and they were kind of like dicks to me. And I'm like a kid. I'm a little kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were like flagrantly dicks, but they were definitely dicky enough. And I'm like, you're, you're treating these kids like they're professionals. I'm not a professional. I'm a child. Yeah, I'm yeah, a child. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's a point where you're like, I don't want to. I remember saying to my mom, I don't want to do this anymore. My mom was like, OK, and so we just left. <laughs> we, we we finished it out and we're like we left and the the people are like no we need you to back like you got to come back we're like You're no like, I don't care <laughs> yeah 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 get some and other I, fucking yeah. pylon to put in here I'm not gonna do it I did one day of background work as a, a young adult on um Honey I Shrunk the Kids in Calgary which they were shooting at the Loose Moose Theater where I worked and so the oh, theater company's cool. like anybody want to just do some stuff and we're like yeah. And they're like, great, we need you to be an usher in this scene. So I, I got dressed up in, in my own like dress clothes and kind of like tuxedo stuff. I, um, again, they were dicks to me and my buddy the whole time. I spilled something on my pants at lunch. I was like, oh, no. And then the wardrobe lady yelled at me for a long time. I'm like, what do you want me to do? I'm like, <laughs> I'm a 19 year old schlub. I spilled stuff on myself. But accidents happened. And then they, they kept getting mad at us. And finally, I said, fuck this. I'm leaving. <laughs> and the AD started yelling at me. He's like, you can't leave. We've already shot half the scene with your coverage. I'm like, yeah. this is not my goddamn problem, dude. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, what yeah. are you talking? At the time, I was making like seven bucks an hour to be a background performer. Oh, man. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to go. I left. And I spoke a cigarette. And they're like, you're never going to work in this town again. And then I booked a, uh, a role on that Cut show. to like... you on Working Moms? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like fuck. No, it was even sooner, though. I booked a, a speaking a speaking role on that show. Like the uh, later that year, but I was like a robot, so I had a mask, and I got like ten. I made a ton of money. I made ten days as like a main character guest star, but okay. because I was wearing a mask, the AD never recognized me. I'm like, this is great. Oh, it was the same AD on that same thing. Yeah, same people. Wow, yeah. what are the odds of that? Anyway, I guess that, just... that kind of disillusioned me too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Damn, there is that like moment when you're a kid where an adult does something where even as a kid you're like, 
you can't talk to me like that. I'm a child. I'm like a you child, recognize man. your own like standing yeah. in society. You're like, I'm literally a child. You're supposed to I be don't nice have to, me. to do this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's this yeah, weird yeah. thing. Where I have to like, do I, my math homework. I don't I have to, have do, to do this. Like it, especially even like in background performance. I'm always um like I'm always nice to background performers when I work. Uh I mean, please don't talk to me <laughs> when we're on set. Uh no eye contact. No eye contact. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I'm always nice because I've I've done it like I did it and I'm like I saw how terrible some people were treated. Most of the sets I've been on, people are treated really well, mm. but it is shocking. Like it's like being a server. Whenever I go to restaurants with people and they're shitty to the server, I'm just like, you piece of shit. Like well, you do you know garbage. do you know what this person is going through right now? Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. any request to your server should be followed by when you have a moment. Can I get this oh my God. when you have a set, when you get a chance? Because I know when that you, you are just stressed the fuck out running around this restaurant. <laughs> oh, yeah. Work is hard. I, I have a real um. Uh, when I first like landed a job in L.A., I remember working with these other young people who were just who had only ever worked and only ever had money. And I'm like, you guys have never been poor. And they and they just treated people. Uh, they weren't bad people, but they just treated people the wrong way. I'm like, mm. Ugh. You, you can tell when people have never worked and it's uh, very off-putting. That blows my mind yeah. when I hear about someone who's like, oh, they've never had a job. Like they mm-hmm. never had to work. And I'm like, never had to work. What you is never that cleaned like? a toilet. You've never had, had somebody pay you like, to clean a toilet. That is, that is the human version of like a golden retriever in like a nice suburb. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Just chilling on the couch all day and eating or just going out and playing and doing it, whatever they want to do with no consequence. Mm-hmm. And everyone like, he's adorable. <laughs> Such a nice person. Such a nice person. Yeah, it's um, easy to be nice. Oh, yeah. the It's hard to be kind. It's easy to be nice. It's hard to be kind to people, sure. I think. Um, the one thing, too, that I got to bring up before we forget is the word of the podcast that you. Oh, right. I wrote something down. I got to remember what it was. The word. All right. What's the oh vulnerability is what I wrote down. Has anyone done vulnerability? Okay. So explain to me why that was your word of choice. Well, so I think that um uh I'm on this kind of kick right now about uh that people uh like do comedy in general uh, often as a defense mechanism. Like we all are probably we all wanted attention and it was a, it's very affirming. It's very addictive to get praise and cheers from an audience. And for me, I feel like I, I hear people say things that are untrue on stage. I think most comics lie on stage or take comedic license, as a lot of people would say. Mm-hmm. But there is a there's a divergent point for me where people are lying so blatantly, they're saying something that's so untrue. Perfect example is like, this is the kind of hack joke of uh, I'm sorry if you or people or friends, you know, have this joke. Uh, but like the hack joke of like, I went to the border agent, border agents like you got you got anything in your trunk? Like, no, just my my buddy's got hash up his ass. Like it's it's one of those or I got pulled over by a cop. and He's like, do you know how fast I was going? Isn't that your job, officer? But it, it's it's sort of that glib thing where you're like, well, you didn't say that. You know, you're yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. didn't say that. I'm like, so you're you're completely just making something up that you think is funny. So there's no there's not even an ounce of truth in it. Whereas I'm mm-hmm. like, I'd rather you say something that has like some level of truth in it and then kind of change it. Maybe you yeah. maybe you're really wildly embarrassed about something you did and you change it to something your friend did. I'm like, I don't mind that. But there's got to be some kernel of honesty. I, or truth. I'll do stuff like that where if I uh, write like a tag where I'm like, oh, that might be like a little like it's funny, but it'd be like a little crass for me to for me personally, like mm-hmm. what forward facing what I look like to an audience to say, I'll just put it on my dad. I'll be like, my right. dad said this to me, you know, and right, it's like, right, right. maybe he, he could have said that to me. But like, it's just always like funny to just completely put that line into someone else's right. face. Like, I never said that shit. <laughs> Yeah, and me and my dad's like, what? How dare you? How dare <laughs> you? I'm getting calls from work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I react. mean, comedic licenses, I have no problems with comedic license, but uh, there is a point where, and I, I again, I'm not trying to point for, we all have like hacky, everyone has hacky weaknesses in their act, but it's, uh, I do think that there's an element of just vulnerable, and I don't think it's just a uh, comedy thing. I think it's any mm-hmm. artist, performer. If you're not vulnerable, 
if, if there's not a, any element of truth and you don't let your guard down at all, then there's a, it's less funny. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I think it's less funny. Even people who are like, even people who are like, um, uh, completely deflective comedians like taking a mark norman who's like hilarious when he's clearly like a deflector kind of comedy he's a joke 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 guy yeah but yeah. there's something in his persona that it's so clear he's doing like non-stop jokes to not have to deal with stuff that it still feels kind of genuine a little bit i get uh, it yeah yeah i don't know i listen to him a lot on podcasts too and um you can kind of like hear a little bit more of his personality and mm -hmm. then but like you said like there's always at the end of every sentence there always has to be like a uh, comedy or comedy. there has to be yeah. like there's something yeah. there you know what i mean there's always it's always bookended by like a joke of some time to get that approval if he's not feeling like he's getting it through what he just said maybe by being vulnerable yes, so he's yeah, like yeah. being vulnerable and then he doesn't get a laugh and he's like i'm gay like he yeah. just says like whatever like yeah, that's what's so funny about him it's like that but his he's, act like... is just the bookend like it's just yeah. that <laughs> just <laughs> just it's just the joke right but i i kind of like that because it's like all right i get who you are you're a person who's just you're <laughs> yeah, an armadillo yeah, yeah. an armadillo of jokes yeah so yeah. i'm on board but anyways that's that's like a, a general thing i've been thinking about um i used to think i was funnier when i was young and new and that's not true i was just crazier I was, I was, uh, wilder. And then, uh, and then I went through a phase where, you know, I don't know, I became a bit more personal on stage, I guess, but if I'm wilder, I think about like it. you were just like very emotive with your actions, uh, probably like I was way more physical and big. Uh, I mean, cause I came from this almost like clowny type background, sure, uh, yeah. very, like very, very physical, but, um, also just weird like i would go i'd improvise giant like i'd, I'd get on stage and i'd improvise i'd improvise like almost whole sets sometimes and do wow. big things like i wouldn't and it'd go pretty well like it would go well um and just kind of like take off like a rocket ship uh and be very absurd i was like almost more silly and absurd and i'm still i still have like silly and absurd stuff but i took like it's i don't know it's just a bit more real and then maybe that's just getting older too Maybe yeah, like, I guess with maturity, you can kind of start to like, like, ah, I don't need to because I when yeah. I was younger, I whenever I'd see like a super like physical comedian and I'm listening mm -hmm. to the jokes and the jokes aren't really I'm like, I'm not getting it like he's getting laughs, but I'm like, I'm not getting right, right, right. right like where are the details here? And then I'm like, I would call it comedy with no legs because it's yeah. just like <laughs> you're just depending. So I'm like, if somebody was listening to this on an album, they'd be like what's happening like what yeah he said four things and then the audience is going crazy and then he hasn't spoken again for a minute and a half <laughs> like <laughs> well uh, to be also like to be contrarian though i mean steve martin was the biggest out well like biggest comedy album of all time and it was uh, his stuff is not great uh no but i on, think it was done like that on purpose like he was almost doing like a parody of like what a bad comedian would be like like uh, sticky the arrow through the head like oh yeah 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 but i mean i'm saying you don't hear an arrow oh, through the sure. head yeah on, yeah on an of course. Album. that's what i mean of course yeah, I'm not, yeah like you see him in concert he's doing the shtick but i'm like on the album you're like you you would just hear like him rummage for something yeah and then there'd be a huge laugh and then there'd be a long pause he goes <laughs> well that got out of hand and you're like yeah. you have no idea what <laughs> happened but it's kind of funnier because you don't know what happened. Uh, yeah, I guess. And then it makes you kind of in this day and age, it would send you to kind of it will send some people to go search for what exactly got, is happening in that moment. Because yeah, I'll do that with podcasts. Even there's something on the podcast. And it's like, I think I need to be watching the video version of this. What did Jamie pull up? I need to know. <laughs> yeah, what yeah, Jamie yeah. Pulled up. <laughs> God of damn, course. that Spotify deal made it so much harder, though, to, right. to pull those videos up. I one of my top viewed videos which is so stupid on my youtube page it was um there was a joe rogan episode with wiz khalifa and i noticed he kept saying yeah yup a lot and i was like <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if i just did a hyper cut of all of his, his yeah yups, yeah yups throughout the podcast only possible by me being able to download that from youtube and mm -hmm. then spend three hours cutting 66 yeah, yup. yeah yups together and i got like oh, yeah. fifty six thousand views or whatever it's just like Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's crazy that that's like part of the entertainment economy now though too is yeah like that memes. you can monetize that like people are meme millionaires mm -hmm. they just make yeah. memes 
Yeah, it's uh, it's because uh, I was gonna originally I thought thought about making my other word evolution because that is, I've I've lived through like people who are just comedians on stage and you have to get better at being comedy mm-hmm. at comedy to become like a middle and then a headliner and then the birth of um MySpace is like pre YouTube like where you get all these old guys who are headliners and they'd be mad because I you know I'd have a clip that is like a quarter of a million views on MySpace would be huge wow, at the time. Yeah, yeah. And then he's like, well, what, like who, who are these MySpace people? I'm like, well, they're the, pe- they're every comic who's successful right now. And mm-hmm. then it became like YouTube and then it became TikTok and Instagram. It's like YouTube Vine even evolve. blew up some people. Vine was huge. You're like, you gotta, yeah, you have to evolve, but also can't we just tell jokes and be stupid? Yeah. It's like, right. do I have to do a reaction video to how somebody peels <laughs> A friggin' banana, uh, and they're like, I'm like, I don't, I just want to know. I felt so tired inside when I realized that I am a stand-up comedian and video editor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did not. When I got into comedy, I never was like, I can't wait to edit all those podcasts and videos clips. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh yeah, it's just That's... annoying. Oh yeah, but I mean, necessary, right? Like you said, if you don't evolve with this kind of stuff it's not like you get left behind but like the reality is you probably won't be seen as much as and if that is the ultimate goal to get people out to your shows yeah like, i mean like you had to get used to have to get stupid headshots like you yeah. used to have to pay four hundred dollars i mean with like a mic around your neck and like did you ever you do like a, a hacky headshot <laughs> oh i'm sure i'm sure i've done that uh, one of those uh i definitely have leather jacket headshots i definitely have i didn't do too many of the cliche stand-up ones i don't think i did a lot of the cliche actor ones that i would just use in the clubs but there's I've, i'm sure i've got a couple like ugh, what was i thinking there what was i thinking uh, the, uh, the the ultimate is like the or the cliche uh comedy bio where it's the, the comedy bio with no with no credits it's like this guy <laughs> has the acerbic wit that has kept audiences in North Michigan rolling for yeah, the- yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always regional yeah. specific. Like, yeah. all across southern Ontario. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I get it. I get it. You need credit. I mean, dude, it's the same down here. It's like credits get it doesn't matter. You have to have credits. You gotta get in. Yeah. You want to get in a comedy club? You're like, all right, you get in a comedy club on your credits, be like, that was great. We had great sales. Who's in next week? This person who did a uh, uh three TikToks. Yeah. Yeah, you know that's minutes. a credit. They're like, oh, he has five million TikTok followers, and you're like, oh, okay, that's as good yeah. as just for laughs on your. It'll on your it'll sheet. get it'll get people. I mean, it does get people into my social media. Does get people into seats, and that I get it. But that's there's amazing. also a point where I remember when Last Comic first came up, first season, and uh, I was performing at clubs after an unnamed person who was on like the first couple seasons, uh, who he was in every club, and he was probably making a shitload of money to be in the clubs. And uh, I was on cleanup. I felt like I was following him with the same booking agent. I felt like I was there the week uh, after. I was getting paid nothing. I was I was I I had a couple a couple credits on Fox MTV. So I was get in and I wouldn't get paid a ton. Be like, who was here last week? It's like, oh, this person. I'm like, oh, was it busy? I'm like, yeah, it was sold out. I'm like, how was the week? It was. It sucked. It was the worst. They're like this guy is terrible. Crowd, but he hated. sold it out. So the club owners like, Meh, whatever. Well, yeah, they don't care. And then they get maybe two cycles, three cycles through, and then they're gone. I mean, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of people like that from the early mid 2000s. I remember following around at these comedy clubs and they were there and they were, I'm sure they were making 10 times what I was making. Uh, but then I would come in and they'd be like, oh, well, this is great because we, we got a great deal on you and you did good at the shows. Yeah. You you off balance the person who did terrible, but we paid. <laughs> we made our money to, back. Yeah, yeah. 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 You're like, how about you just cut that his check in half and just, yeah. you know, give half that I'll, to me? I'll take it. Yeah. That'd be funny if clubs booked that way instead. Like you got a fee up front for whatever the weekend. And then if the show, like you have like a laugh meter and if the show stayed in red for like the whole weekend, it's like, guess what? $3,000 extra bonus. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, we I'll sold say out this. four shows. Here's something that doesn't happen in Canadian. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's happened in a handful of Canadian clubs. But like the bump, you get bumps in American clubs. You'll get a bump. Like you have your fee, even if it's not negotiated in your fee, not always, but like often like it's, it's packed in the crowd and, and he had a great weekend and like the owner will be like, here's whatever. 
Oh, that's Here's great. Here's an extra 500 bucks or... Yeah, yeah, something. Know, or something like, oh, cool. Um, whereas I've never seen that at a lot of Canadian clubs. <laughs> yeah. Of course not. We're like always 50 years behind. Um, mm-hmm. I want to ask you about, because I'm curious, uh, what was your like first like big acting role where you were like getting like a consistent like fat paycheck where you're like okay i'm i'm legit like this is i'm good like i got the you know weight lifted off my shoulders for a little while a little while yeah i've never felt the weight fully lift off my shoulders probably the very first like big gig was a movie called going the distance which is like early 2000s it was a big uh road movie uh in the states it was national lampoons uh, going the distance um and it was one of the highest budget canadian movies made at that time it was just a road movie it was like a sexy romp road movie and it was like i made like a a grown man salary for the year uh and then you lose a lot of it quickly because you're young and dumb and yeah Uh, that's my next question what was like uh doesn't last (laughs) what was your biggest like frivolous purchase when you got those checks where you're like i'm just gonna i don't care how much this costs i'm just gonna get myself this because i want it uh i think well i'm like that i can't remember what i got off that gig because it was i was so broke i remember being super broke and landing some commercials. I was like, oh, and then suddenly I, I the wheels started turning. I started making some money. But I was like comically broke. I probably weighed like 130 something pounds. Uh, I remember all, all these lovely ladies in the comedy scene who were like, women notice this, guys don't. They're all like, all the guys just thought I was addicted to heroin. And the, <laughs> they didn't, the no girls, one tried to stop you. They're like, oh yeah, he's no, just he's addicted just to heroin. Got, <laughs> he's probably just on heroin and speed and that but like some of the ladies in the scene would like deliver food to me because they realized i had no money and i was so broke and then um and then it kind of turned around but i guess there was what did i get a a mac computer was the big one probably from that movie nice i always wanted a a better computer to write on at the time and then the a couple other big gigs but i did this fox sitcom which went for a season and off that i bought a car i'd always wanted a car i bought a used mini coupe cooper but it was like back when they were cool many coopers are yeah my girlfriend was asking me she's like if i were to get a car would you say like a fiat or like a mini cooper and i was like german engineering all the way i was like italians don't make good cars yeah (laughs) (laughs) i was like they make great pasta wine is perfect but no no, i'm not buying a car from and the fiat well it's it's an american car the fiat's now yeah 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 now it's even worse yeah (laughs) Yeah, it's even worse you want want a chrysler (laughs) but the um yeah that was the big one yeah that's but it comes and goes it was it's sort of like you never there's very few people who have consistent super high years and back you know it's kind of gone up and down that's just kind of the nature of acting like going back to what you said you're just waiting to get picked and that's kind of that world and you're trying to do the most that you can i mean in the meantime well, and, and it comes back to having stand-up like dude sure. it's like this is a craft this is uh i never uh i always wanted to act and be a performer and be like i always love acting and i want to you know i want to be in sitcoms and movies but yeah. that's not why i did stand-up i just did stand because i love performing and i loved the craft of that and it's like dude i still go back to that i mean i'm yeah. i'm not on a show right now i'm i'm ass deep in in union strikes in la everything's shut That's down crazy. all my friends I, friends everyone's losing health insurance in their homes and like meanwhile i can still rock out and do a tour like i can go yeah. pick up my bags Thank and God. go like i'm a one-man machine i can still go and do it i don't need yeah. netflix and i don't need those things i mean they help sell tickets but it, they don't yeah, yeah yeah i heard an interesting theory about the strike and Netflix specifically. Tell me what you think yeah. about this. Andrew yeah. Schultz actually said this on Twitter. He okay. thinks that like the the goal of the strike is to basically find out like, you know, what are Netflix's actual numbers right. of like the streams they're getting so that they can, you know, like YouTube does add revenue share on like if you have a certain amount of views and like the stance of your channel, whatever. Why can't Netflix do the same thing where you get mm. like a monthly payout? Everybody that was involved with the project. Here's how many people watched it. That's the way it's been done for years. Right. Right. And he thinks that like if Netflix is forced to share their numbers, they might be 
not as high as they're saying that they are. And it's a little bit of market manipulation that's been going on over the last couple of years to drive up the stock price so that they can afford to make their own projects Mm. because the licensing deals were running out on all the stuff that they used to get popular with. And now they're spending millions on like their own products. And like, I don't think that's the case. I think, well, I think that there is an element of, they have a lot of shows that are total turd burglars that, Sure, yeah. They put up there and nobody knows and they're like, nobody watches them and they bought them and then they don't have to answer to anybody. Like there's no, Oh, this show was a, what sucked. And it yeah, cost a hundred million dollars. Yeah, they yeah, get canceled. Yeah. 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 There's never that. There's no stink. There's no canceled shows on Netflix. That's uh, true. So this, yeah. There's right? no, cause there used to be shows like on networks where they would film a whole season and then cancel it. Cause they're yeah, like three episodes in. Yeah. 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 And and I mean I lo- I don't mind that format because you might think something's a piece of garbage, but you know maybe ten million people don't watch that show, but maybe a hundred thousand people watch that show, and then they got their niche. Sure, you could yeah. argue that like that hundred thousand people are going to watch it every year for the next ten years is going to pay off because they'll keep their Netflix subscription. I get all that, but the um, I think some of them are way higher. That's the other thing. There's like way. Like, like with oh, working so moms, underselling the people working for them. Well, I mean, just to get perspective, like with working moms in May and part of was it May or June? It was the number one streamed show in all of America. Wow! So you're like ahead of Ted Lasso, ahead of I can't remember what else was out at the time. Uh, was it The Witcher? No, The Witcher would probably have beaten it. There's some other like fantasy, like it's a big, some yeah, big shows. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, so this is. And I remember hearing like some stats thrown around, like half a billion hours viewed and things wow. like that. And you're like, this is it's it's an insane amount. And here's like a little can, like Canadian show that's this huge hit on this on arguably the biggest network in in America, and people are watching it. There's no way that the revenue is being shared appropriately. Like that's not how how no. it goes. Yeah, and then yeah. there's a movie that maybe what well, they paid. Um, some huge movie studio like got Chris Hemsworth to do this one action movie and the movie cost $80 million and Chris Hemsworth got paid $17 million, all this shit. Yeah. And it it was watched a lot for like a week and a half and it disappears. So it becomes this weird thing. Like they don't want those optics. I don't know. I've I've also heard that there there's infighting in the MPT where it's like Netflix doesn't want to share because they want to share their information with Amazon and Disney and HBO. Mm. So they're all kind of, in a detente where they don't want to show anyone yeah, wants to show yeah. their numbers. They're all kind of like, who's going to do it first? <laughs> right. Like there's no yeah, way yeah, that a yeah, series yeah. on Peacock is really probably competing with uh, uh, what the boys on Amazon sure, or yeah. the Mandalorian on Disney. So they don't want to, I don't know. It's just stupid. The it whole thing's infuriating. It's my second yeah, strike yeah. since living in LA. It's depressing. Oh, God damn. Well, I hope it gets solved soon. And you don't have to keep going through that. But at least you still have stand up. I mean, that's that's good, too. You're mm-hmm. welcome back on the Johnny Rogers show anytime. <laughs> right on. Sure. <laughs> uh, there's a question that I ask all my guests is if you could get on a phone call with 15 yeah. year old Ryan, give him right. a piece of advice based on what you know now, knowing it won't affect their timeline. So timeline stays the same it's not okay. going to impact your own timeline whatsoever okay okay what do you um say? uh oh that's tough uh what advice would i give him um oh what's the number one? that's a t- that's tricky you know i could say i had a lot of anxiety when i was young so i could say it'll get better but um just uh just stick with it like go do do um i would say like almost go to la earlier and stay and stay like just just fight through the tough time and uh yeah that's it because there there's yeah there's a point where i got burned i started so young that i'm probably i've probably burnt out twice Mm -hmm. in my career at least so far and i've come back and and then I get re-energized and I go, go, go. Like right now I feel great. I'm on a roll. But uh, I've definitely had a couple different burnouts. The first time was when I moved back from LA in 2000, in the early, mid, late 2000s. And I was like, just burnt out. And I'm like, I wasn't putting in the work. I was just like, ugh. Whereas real, realistically, I should have stayed and kept pushing and, and mm-hmm. doing stuff. And, you know, that's sometimes that's the 
you're like, I don't want to do those shitty gigs anymore. I don't want to do those sh- like that. These terrible job. I don't want to go to like terrible middle America for whatever, like no money and, yeah. and bust my ass for what? And you're like, well, just do it for three more years and then something's going to happen. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I'd say just keep keep pushing through. That's all. Yeah, that's good advice. But yeah, maybe I would say, yeah, move, move, go. Just force. I feel like I've, I I feel like I kind of lucked into stuff and I was pushed. I moved to Toronto because my ex long first time ex told me to move. Like, you have to leave. We broke up. She's like, you have to get out of here. You have to go do something. I, then I ended up in L.A. because I booked parts on shows and jobs. And, OK, and I was in L.A. And then I'm like, it, I just kind of went there because the stream took me there. I'm like, take a little more agency in your own. Mm. what do you want what do go you want because you want to go not just because there's a job there waiting for you yeah yeah johnny i talked to so many comics you're like i want to do this for i want to do this for a living and like okay well what does that what does that look like man what do you yeah. think that looks like is that playing in oshawa in like 20 years is that what you picture yeah. it and like yeah. no i want to be i want to be on the late night shows i want to be doing this and like then move to like buy a plane ticket to new york like right now yeah and just go and start doing it like, and just be around to, that yeah yeah, be around it. Like you're, right now, you're just cutting your teeth in this club and this one. Like, wh- what is your goal? Just go for it. That's what I would say. Like, what do you actually want? And then how do you like start making that happen? What do yeah, you want yeah. to have happen? Just start making that happen. I say that now. I have tickets on sale for my Oshawa show at <laughs> RyanBevel.com at the something Oshawa Performing Arts. I think it's the Performing Arts. Yeah, I'm not if sure. If you uh, follow yeah. Ryan on Instagram, it's Boost Rocket. And that link will be in the description. Also, RyanBelville.com. Toronto, yeah. September 15th and 16th at, where is it? Comedy Bar East. This will be, the Comedy Bar show will be a bit more off kilter, a bit more weird stuff. And then the real tour starts on the 4th. Which is the, the com- I'm Not Your Daddy tour. I'm Not Your Daddy tour. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you got Vaughn, October 4th. Guelph, October 5th. Waterloo, October 6th. London, October 7th. So you're going all over. Yeah. Uh, people can check that website, ryanbelville.com to get more of the... Or Hubcap, uh, or it's also or linked Hubcap? to my site. Yeah, all, all the tickets okay. at the top, you can click on that and it'll take you to every every date, all 18 of our first, first leg of our tour. Definitely should go check out Ryan, guys, if you're watching and listening to this. You're absolutely hilarious. Every time I saw you at Absolute, I was like, man, I wish I could be half as good as this oh, guy. Johnny, I appreciate it. Appreciate <laughs> I also a little low key right give now. You, but... uh, give you a big thanks too, because you like i brought up restarby earlier but you connected me on like such a cool opportunity i don't even think we had really met you just made a post in the toronto stand-up community being like hey does anyone can someone work the merch table at the jfl show for restarby uh, and i was like yeah right. i'll do it yeah and then so zoe was telling me she's like um so here's all the stuff like here's a cash box she's like just so you know like nobody really buys these like we put it out there as like just yeah. in case like if you can sell one great. And I took that as like my mission for that yeah. like 20 minutes I had. And that was like a, literally like a salesman, like buy this DVD. Like it's, it's none of the stuff you're going to be seeing tonight. Like I was giving it like a whole sales pitch and I sold like eight of them. And he was like, Oh, oh wow. God. Thank you so much. Like, <laughs> took a photo with oh, me. I was like, was so, I got to watch the show. Like it was just such a cool uh, experience. And it was all facilitated by you just reaching out, looking for somebody. Oh, thank you. Well, here's, I'll share this funny Reese story that, um, Cause I knew him for a while and, uh, and through Zoe as well, they, they, they said, Hey, do you want to go do Reese's show at the just for laughs in Sydney? Um, this is like six or seven years ago. I'm like, yes, I definitely do. Reese Darby and friends at the Sydney opera house for Crazy. the comedy festival. I'm like, please. And it was extra meaningful because back when I was a street performer and performing, I used to perform at the, in front of the Sydney opera house Whoa. at the, at the keys there. And uh, so it's like I'm back where I was when I was like 18, 19, 20 years old. Just a dumb, skinny kid smoking cigarettes and trying to make people laugh at the at the uh, was at the harbor there. And then now I'm performing inside. And then Reese came out. We got to do a, a fun thing. We videotaped it where he he did a, a whole shout out to my dad because my dad's Australian. Oh, I remember that video. Yeah. So it was like <laughs> it was just like, oh, good night. Every, everybody's like, good night, Terry. And the whole crowd's like, good night, Terry. And then, yeah, so you get to have like. 1800 people yell and you said to my dad. something like uh like i didn't go to college yes <laughs> like, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right 
yeah which is so the perfect thing cool. to yell in front of a stadium of people just like yeah just yes. cheering that you're on stage that's yeah. so great yeah yeah i take i take a lot of comfort in the fact that i'm like all the people I didn't like growing up and the people who thought performing's dumb or those hockey dicks who hated artsy fartsy guys. I'm like, they're all losers who just who do nothing anymore. They work at their dad's yeah, yeah. like you still yeah, got their letterman their jackets company. on. <laughs> yes, there's exactly. Yeah, the, or the, de- the, yeah, the denim jacket with the leather sleeves. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah we all like, know. Sorry, guys. guys. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Well, man, thanks so much for making the time. I mean, it's no problems, Johnny. Clock here. I appreciate it. I'll send this uh, over to you as soon as it's up. I think it'll Cheers, be coming buddy. out September eighth. September eighth. That's fantastic. I'll see you in uh, Ottawa, maybe. Definitely. It, Have a great couple, rest of your day, bro. Months. Yeah, you too. Buddy. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. You've been listening to the Johnny Rogers Show. New episodes air every Friday at eight p.m. Eastern Standard Time. <laughs>